We're nearly there with the, the children and everybody going out. So Rupert is going to share this morning. Uh, as he mentioned, it's the next, uh, his next part in the Oxymoron ser or series that he's doing. So we'll be interested to hear what he has to say. Um, Louise is going to read the scripture from Ephesians in a few minutes, but we'll just pray with Rupert first before he shares. Dear God, thank you for Rupert. Thank you for this little mini-series and, and what you've put in his heart to share with us. And just pray that we'll all be open to, to listen, to hear through his words what you have in your heart. And it will be a real blessing today. Pray for Rupert during it. Amen. Uh, this is a reading from Ephesians 1, and it's verses 9 and 10. He made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in Christ, to be put into effect when the times reach their fulfillment, to bring unity to all things in heaven and on earth under Christ. Amen. Okay, <clears throat> thank you, Louise and Roy, for prayer and uh, reading that scripture. So we're in the middle of just a, a, a little Rupert kind of mini-series, which I've called Oxymoron, just because the word makes me chuckle. And, um, but it's really just thinking about uh, oxymoron means where there's two words or phrases that at first glance seem incompatible. But actually, maybe when you explore a little bit more, uh, there is uh, more compatibility than it first seems. So we've looked at uh, charismatic and contemplative. I'm, I'm doing three here, which I feel um, are important for us as a church in the coming you know, year and years that we hold these things together. So we've done charismatic and contemplative, uh, looking at the charismatic tradition and the uh, contemplative tradition, which at first glance might seem very different, but actually right at the heart, there's something about the spirit that dwells and is with us, uh, and that we can draw on both of these traditions as we learn how to be with Jesus. And the hope is that as we are with Jesus, that we come fully alive. Uh, and then the second one was about being gathered and scattered, uh, as a church that we gather together, but we're also scattered. And so as we become fully alive um, and as we gather, then we are scattered and we bring the life of Jesus into various places that we work or we live uh, and uh, bring that life to others. And so today I want to think about togetherness and difference. Um, we're living in an increasingly fractious and very anxious world. Um, I thought about putting lots of examples in here, but I'm just going to assume that we all know that. <laughs> I, I don't really think it needs stating. Um, and we're increasingly divided and in our tribes and our camps. Uh, I read something the other day um, which begins to touch on, I think, our, our approach to difference as a culture, and maybe uh, we can identify with it, some of this ourselves. In our cancel culture, we experience the consequences of difference as negative. Cancel culture is a space in which I can remove not only the things with which I disagree, but the people behind those things. It's not discernment, but it's a fundamental rejection of another because they're different. Despite all the training in our schools and businesses and et cetera, et cetera, often the only kind of diversity that is acceptable is diverse like me. I, I thought that was a particularly penetrating critique of our approach as culture to difference. And I, I think we often think of difference as somehow wrong or bad. And so today I want to do a bit of theological work. Don't get freaked out. It's fairly, I'm going to try and make it really simple. But we're going to just think about a theology of difference. wonder if you've ever heard or thought about that. Theology of difference. <clears throat> and then we're going to think about the vision of the kingdom of God. And how on earth we might hold together difference and togetherness. So... Got four things we're going to do. 
Difference is part of God's original design. Difference exists within the Trinity, but in a really helpful, non-competitive way. That uh, togetherness is God's plan. And then the church is to model togetherness and difference. So that's where we're going to go, okay? Scoosh through it, and then we're going to think really practically at the end, how do we do this? Because if we're honest, this is really hard, isn't it? I think, well, I think it's really hard. So when you read the poem at the beginning of Genesis chapter 1, this kind of story or poem about creation, you see that God creates in the world a huge amount of variety and difference. There's the difference between light and darkness, day and night, the heavens and the earth the land and the sea, the fish and the birds, the animals on the land. There's difference there. There's livestock, animals that it says scurry along the ground and wild animals. And then the difference between animals and humans and then between male and female. There's a massive amount of difference that God seems to bring in right at the beginning of the story. Scientists apparently estimate that there are 8.7 million different types of species in the world. 8.7. And so far, they've only discovered 1.2. Which I think is really fascinating when we think about scientific advancement and discovery, that they've only seemed to discover 1.2 million species, and they think there's 8.7 million different species. I mean, extraordinary. Now, this one is for Justin. There are apparently 4,000 different types of bees. 4,000 different types of bees. I wonder how many you can mention or know. I know two. <coughs> Bumblebee. <laughs> honeybee. Anyone advance on two? I'm sure, I don't know if Justin's in. I think he's maybe the kids. Alison's definitely putting her hand up, so well done, Alison. Maybe Justin knows a few more than that. But 4,000 types of bees. Like, you'd have thought when God created a bee, just one would have been enough. 4,000. So right at the very fabric of creation, God seems to like variety. He seems to like difference. I mean, Stefan, you must, you know, encounter this in your botanical world. The different varieties of plants and different things and the different varieties of human beings that there are. At the very fabric of creation is variety and difference. And it's good. Difference is not because things are wrong or bad or out of kilter, but it's because God seems to actually delight in difference. Difference is to be celebrated. I, I don't know about you, but I, I think at best I can toler, you know, tolerate difference. But it seems right at the beginning, God celebrates difference. Now, unfortunately, we do see as the story unfolds, that difference leads to tension as the story goes on in Genesis specifically. And more, more specifically, I, I, I've been using the word competition. Difference leads to competition. This competition emerges with humans competing with God. So the serpent comes along right at the beginning of Genesis chapter 3 and says, if you eat this fruit, then it says you would be like God. So the difference is not the problem, it's the competition that emerges within it. And then there is difference between human beings. The, the first man and the first woman, your desire will be to control your husband, but he will rule over you. So the difference isn't the problem, it's the competition that comes with it. When we try and better or we think we're right and they're wrong, or we try and compete with other human beings, or even try and compete with God. So now, difference is fraught with difficulty. And let's be honest, isn't it much easier to be with people who are like us? 
Or is that, is that just me? It's much easier to be with people that are like us, that think the same or similar, that look the same or similar, that have the same kind of worldviews and outlooks. It's, isn't it much easier? So difference, I would suggest, is not the problem. God delights and celebrates in difference. He's made that right at the fabric. The problem is that difference is now fraught with difficulty and competition, and it makes it incredibly challenging. This is really hard stuff. So that's point number one, that difference (coughs) is part of God's original design. Point number two is thinking about the Trinity, that difference is right in the fabric of the Godhead, Father, Son, and Spirit. They're different. Three persons and yet somehow one, different and yet somehow together. And I, I'm not going to say too much about this, but I think there's this brilliant bit in, the po- in a poem in Philippians 2 where it's talking about Jesus and, he, and, it, and, and the poem says that <clears throat> who Jesus, who was in his very nature God, but he didn't consider equality with God something to be clung to or grasped. Some translations have grasped or clung to. I think that's the best way of putting it. In other words, there was difference between the Father, God the Father, and the Son, but Jesus didn't cling or grasp. And it's the grasping or the competition that is so unhelpful. So in the Trinity, we see the difference between these three parts of the Godhead, and yet they're together, they're one, they're in perfect harmony. So God models something for us of how we can think about difference and togetherness without grasping. Togetherness and difference is part of God's plan, which brings us to the scripture of the week. As the Trinity models this togetherness and difference, it's actually what we discover is it's God's heart for all of creation. In the midst of extraordinary difference, particularly between human beings, he desires togetherness. He has made known to us the mystery of his will. So something that was hidden previously has now suddenly become clear, and yet it's still a mystery according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in Christ to put into effect or to bring to completion when the times reach their fulfillment. So this is, he's talking about this mystery that is being revealed, that's being shown to us, but it will come into its fullness at the end of this age, as we enter into the age to come. When the times reach their fulfillment, to bring to unity all things. To bring together all things in heaven and on earth under Christ. Now this, this word unity um, also could be translated summed up. So it's a bit of God's maths going on here. And God's maths, I don't know whether you know this, but God's maths is very different from our maths. So I sometimes say this at weddings or you know, when a couple get engaged that God's maths goes like this. One plus one equals one. Rupert plus Pippa equals one. And yet we're still different. So God's summed up or unity is like the equal sign. It's like what happens when two things that are different come together under Christ They're still different, but one. How does that work? If anybody knows me and Pippa, we are very different. (laughs) 
very different. Yet one plus one equals one. So this is the equals sign. This is all things that are different will be brought together to be one. Now, unity, I want to suggest, or togetherness, requires difference. Unity only works when we're different. Unity is bringing together two things or more things that are different. If we're the same, it's not unity. It's sameness. Or this word that I can't pronounce, but I'm going to try. Homogeneity. Is that right? It's not quite right, is it? Anyway, sameness. So if you have two things that are the same that are brought together, you just have sameness. You don't have unity. Unity at its very basic understanding means it's two things that are different that are coming together. Not to make them the same, but to bring them together in the midst of the difference. I find that hugely helpful, but enormously challenging. And a bit later on in Ephesians, we see this mystery being played out in practice in the church in Ephesus. It's the coming together of two things or two groups of people that are enormously different. It's the coming together of the Jews and the Gentiles into one body. One plus one equals one. Jews, Gentiles, one plus one equals one. They're they're meant to be one body. And yet you may know that the Jews and Gentiles prior to all of this were almost incompatible. It's a bit like the rivalry between, you know, I don't know, hearts and heads. Edinburgh, Glasgow, Scotland, England at Murrayfield next weekend. It's that kind of thing, but in Christ, one plus one equals one. Jews and Gentiles equals one body. And he talks about this dividing wall of hostility being broken down. Now, there were some who said, no, the Gentiles need to become Jews if they're going to participate in the body of Christ. In other words, they need to become like us, the same as us, to be together. But the early church said, no, 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 no. That's not the way it works. They're still Gentiles, and you're still Jews, but it equals one. Two things, Jews and Gentiles, whatever else we might think about, that seem incompatible are made one together in Christ in the midst of their differences. So, this is God's ultimate plan, that things that are different come together as one. And my fourth point is the church is to model this difference and togetherness. The church is a prototype community It lives, or we live as a church, as part of the church. We're a church that's part of the church. But the church lives in light of the age to come. When the times have reached their fulfillment, when heaven and earth are joined together fully, so we live in this time and space in the reality of the age to come, that heaven has come and will fully come and be joined together in earth. In another passage in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, Paul talks about God is reconciling the world to himself, bringing together two things that are different and incompatible. And then he says that you are Christ's ambassadors. So we are Christ's ambassadors. We're there to represent Jesus in the world in which we live and to live out the culture of heaven or Jesus' culture here and now. In other words, we are meant to live the culture of the age to come in this age, to represent and show, be an ambassador of what God will do in Christ. 
that the world may see. So I, many of you know, I lived in Pakistan for two years. Um, <clears throat> and I went for a visit to renew my visa or something, I can't remember, but to the British Embassy. Now, Pakistan is um, noisy, bustly, dusty, hot. And you walk through the doors of the British Embassy, and it's cool, it's calm, it's ordered, it's British. Now, please, I'm not making any comments about the rights or wrongs of different culture. I'm just saying there's a contrast between the British Embassy in the middle of Pakistan. that you walk into the British Embassy and you experience the culture of Britain in the middle of a foreign culture. That's what the church is meant to do. The culture of heaven is meant to be embodied amongst us that when people walk in here, they go, oh, that's different. Because we live in light of the age to come. Our citizenship is not here, but there. That's who we represent, first and foremost. We're not Scottish or English or British or wherever we come from. We're not male or female. We're not gay or straight. We're not whatever, black or white. We're citizens of heaven, first and foremost. And we represent the culture of heaven here now which is that togetherness exists in the midst of difference. So we're meant to live this stuff out. Sean and I were just having a coffee. Sean's doing an amazing job on the tech on Friday, and um, I hadn't told him what I was preaching. And we just got talking about this stuff. He, well, he was telling me, actually, I was like, Sean, halfway through, I said, Sean, you've just done my sermon for Sunday. And then he referenced these verses. So I'm using these verses because Sean referenced them and they're brilliant, really appropriate. But later in Ephesians, it talks about be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the spirit through the bond of peace. Make every effort to keep the unity of the spirit through the bond of peace. So, difference, God delights in difference. He thinks it's fantastic. <laughs> it was his idea. He celebrates difference. But it's come with some difficulty and com competition because of the fallenness of human beings. So we find this more challenging. We find this quite difficult and painful often. But God exists as different and yet one. He models this perfectly in Trinity. And his goal, his plan, is to bring all things together under Christ that are different that they could be one, that they don't lose their difference, but in the midst of their difference, they're together. And we're to live this out. How do we do that? I've got three things in a minute that I'm just gonna very briefly share, but we've got an open mic, we've got a few minutes. How, how do we live this out? I hope that theologically you go, oh, that's, yeah, I agree with that. That's really helpful. <laughs> maybe there's one or two new things, or maybe it's all completely the other. But how do we live this out? This is where the rubber hits the road. So let's just pause for a moment, and then I'd love to hear from a few people. If you could briefly share, maybe just no more than a minute, just something you found really helpful. Let me just finish actually with one story from Colin actually. 
So years ago, we were doing a, a, like a pre-alpha course, Colin. I don't know if you remember this, but this had a massive impact on me. And we were, it was called Connections. And I was doing some teaching one day on Connections, and it was about helping people understand the gospel. And I kept on contrasting what we were teaching with the Catholics, who were wrong. And we were, I was right. I was a young lad, you know. And Colin graciously just, you know, listened to me. And then right at the end, you probably don't remember this, do you? But Colin just graciously said to me, Rupert, you're very negative about the Catholics. Why is that? Oof, good question. And it really helped me go on a journey of thinking, actually, this is not helpful. This is not togetherness indifference and you've really modeled that Colin with people who are different from us we may not agree with everything you may not agree with everything of their theology or their practice but we can be together we can be one in the midst of difference so how do we do that Sean hello you've come from behind the tech team yes I have and you had prior knowledge of all of this, so it's great. I'd <laughs> love to hear. Over I just to want to underscore the verse really brings out attention. Right? So if you experience tension uh, when working out conflict, uh, you're living this verse. You're being obedient to it, and it is good, even though it is never pleasant. Um, as someone who's experienced deep emotional hurt uh, and like spiritual attacks from other people who literally tried to call me like, not Christian for some of the differences we have. Uh, I think a really helpful thing for me in figuring out how to do this uh, is just kind of maybe drawing a line in the sand about where does this do damage to someone? Where does it devalue someone? Where, when do I become antagonistic towards someone? And it, it doesn't become about how do we live together well or how do we serve Jesus better or, or working through ideas, it becomes more about just being nasty. Uh, I think just taking a step back and when, in any discussion of, from with my wife or two people who are antagonistic to me, it helps to have that line to be like, okay, what, what team am I playing for again? Um, yes. Am I doing harm? Am I being harmed? Is this dangerous? Uh, am I making, is this not safe? Um, because I think that helps me do this, because you do this in safety. You do this in love with one another. Um, yeah. Thanks, Sean. Thank you. Be great to hear from one or two others. Joy. I think one thing uh, that would be helpful for me is for others not to assume sameness. Mm. I think when we assume that we are the same, or that we agree on the same things, um, that's, that can be really unhelpful because it doesn't make us curious about others. Yeah. So that, uh, the flip side of that is to encourage curiosity and um, for me to be curious about someone who's different. And then if someone is curious about something that they see as different in me or that I hold different beliefs on, to be open and gentle with what I might perceive as their lack of understanding or that they, they should have tried harder. Um, but actually, if someone's being curious to me, and I had a, an amazing experience with someone who was on a transgender journey, and she was just incredibly gentle with me and, um, as I was, and allowed me to be curious about her journey. And she just gently corrected me on a few assumptions that I made. And it was a really amazing interaction. Um, yeah, the, the, the gentleness around me being curious with her, I found, I, I really valued that. Excellent, thanks, Joy. Joanna. <clears throat> this is both a habit that the Lord instilled in me way back, but it is just a fit. How can we, as a body, um, walk in oneness as we meet together? And we had wonderful worship, thank you, Paul. But the habit I have, um, and I wondered if we 
did something like this. Instead of singing, I will worship, I will build, I will this, I will that, we actually change it to we. So we are a body. We will build our foundation on you, Jesus. We are one body. We come together. I can sing the I songs when I'm on my own. Lord, I will worship you. But when I'm here, I'm part of a body. I am not a single person. And I think if we look back in time, the I songs really are only 50, 60 years old. The older hymns are we or you. And I wonder if we've lost something about we are one. Yes. And what is it to be one? We come together and we are the body of, the, of Christ. And it is our privilege to come together and declare into those heavenly realms, we are his body and he is our head. Yes. And we are one. And we break down the dividing walls between us. Yes. When I recognize I'm one with you, I come into this corporate place, and I long to have our worship declare that, that together we will build our foundation on you, Jesus, because you are the foundation of our lives. And I can go home and say, I will worship you, <laughs> but we will worship you together. Excellent. Thank you, Joanna. Is there anyone else? Colin, I'm so glad you're going to share something. I think one of the things for me that God has encouraged me and challenged me to do and has kind of written over my life a bit in what I'm still doing are the words, how close can I get? How close can I get to you? Particularly if you're different to me. And I think one of the problems that we face in our world is that we define ourselves by our differences and then we put a division between us. We, we stand away. Well, I'm not like you, but actually what God's been teaching me a lot about is coming closer. Um, Rupert graciously mentioned that connection I have with Catholic brothers and sisters I think it was quite ironic because Kuba, who's sitting with me, is from a Catholic community in Poland, so it's lovely that that's actually happening. But also, recently, uh, I've been walking quite closely with Jewish people, and a few weeks ago, was in the synagogue just around the corner, and it was wonderful. I had a great time there. And how do we get closer? How do I get close? By basically, and, and George just said it in a way, about being curious, about coming close, about seeking to understand and saying, God, how close can I get? And uh, you will know you can get really, in fact, I've got amazingly, surprisingly close. Um, I'm going to give us, give us away. Chris is sitting over there. And we have a, a brother called Father Martin, who is now working in Germany, who's a Catholic priest. And many years ago, um, he was celebrating his first mass at Lanz Corona in Poland, where, you know, I often go, going back there again. And he invited us to come and serve at the altar. And we went, what? How can we do that? We're Protestants. But he just said, I want you to be there. You can't, but you can't receive communion. It's not allowed under a Catholic practice, but there's nothing to stop you actually participating in helping me to administer the, the communion. It was just awesome. And we were, it was in the open air. It was a beautiful sunny day. And we were dressed in white things, <laughs> albs, I think they're called. White. And it was just the most wonderful thing. And, and it was, again, that, that example of how close can I get? And I just want to encourage us to ask that question uh, all the time. How close can I be? Brilliant. Thank you, Colin. Oh, Chris. Just enjoyed the memory of those white things. <laughs> Um, when I was young and uh, aspiring young church leader and we had differences, then we knew what to do. We fell out and we went different directions and never spoke to each other again. Um, and somewhere along the way, um, we figured out that that probably wasn't the best way of doing it. And that was 
kind of with these guys here, um, where we have had enormous differences of different kinds over the years, and we have we have explored those differences, and we've talked about those differences, and um, we've not resolved those differences in all cases. But at the end of it, we've we have hugged and genuinely loved and appreciated. And so I just wanted to say what Rupert has shared this morning is not just words, 20 minutes of words in a, in a moment. It is a history, a long story um, with bumps and bruises in it over a long period of time, which is possibly the greatest treasure I've taken out of this community. I am. Um, and so I've, I experience it regularly here, and I think it's just woven in, you know, following Colin around to all kinds of places, having conversations with Rupert, um, discussing different views with brothers and sisters here, and finding at the end of it an enormous surge of Holy Spirit love and kindness coming, which is still surprising. But I think it is the flavor of heaven. Yeah. Thanks, Chris. Um, it's very meaningful. I would say that uh, there's been another practice that I've done which may not be dividing or separating and going our ways, but trying to convince people that they're wrong and I'm right. If you've been on the receiving end of that, Colin, I'm really sorry. Because I think part of togetherness and difference is respecting that people are different and see things differently and I don't have to convince them that they're wrong and I'm right and I love this passage in Ephesians chapter 4 because what Paul starts with is unity he says make every effort to keep the unity of the spirit and he then goes on and he talks about difference he says there is a grace that comes on some people to be apostles and prophets and pastors and teachers. You're different, but you start with unity. So that's my number one thing. When I go to people, you know, hearing some of your experiences, Colin, or when I meet people who are different, try and start with we're together. We're one. Not where are the differences that divide. The second thing this passage talks about here is be completely humble. We, we can start with humility. There's a, a social psychologist and professor at New York University called Jonathan Haidt. And he's written a book called The Righteous Mind with subtitled Why Good People Are Divided by Politics and Religion. And one of the ideas that he puts forward in this is that when it comes to deciding about what is right or wrong, we tend to think that we use reason to make those decisions. He suggests that actually isn't the case. We tend to intuit very quickly what's right and wrong, and then use reason to back up our initial hunch. And we have no idea that we do it. So he's suggesting that actually the <clears throat> initial intuition may be formed on the basis of what our family, friends, or others we look up to themselves think. In other words, we make an emotional response first, and then do we only use reason to back up our initial emotional response. Now, if there's any truth in that, if there's any truth in that, gosh, I need to approach my opinions with a good dose of humility because maybe they're not as rational and right as I think they are. Furthermore, if I think about some of the things that I passionately advocated for in my 20s and 30s and have now changed my mind on, or at least significantly have more nuance than I used to, Maybe there'll be things in my 60s and 70s that I look back on my 50-year-old self and go, oh, Rupert. One of the hardest things of being a preacher in the internet age is your sermons are up there from 25 years ago. 
please don't go and listen to them. <laughs> so I'm trying to hold things more lightly than I used to. And yet, oh, and my second one is curiosity, which I really agree with what others have said. Once I let my judgments down, which are mostly there because of fear, I can approach the other, the one who's different with curiosity. Who are they? What motivates them? What do they believe and why? I'm just about to go to another Bridge Builders course and I always meet fascinating people there who come from very different theological and ecclesiological traditions to me. I remember going to one of these courses and there was a retired vicar there. There was about 20 of us. I was a participant on this course, actually, rather than a trainer. And he'd worked the room in about an hour and a half in the most amazing way. He'd gone up and he'd connected with everybody. And he came up to me and he asked, us about my, asked me about my church background and all kinds of stuff. And then he said, oh, that's really fascinating because I'm a liberal charismatic. I'm like, what's a liberal charismatic? And he said, oh, I don't believe in the resurrection of Jesus, but I pray for the sick, lay hands on them, and they get healed in my services. I'm like, how does that work? I, I mean, I literally have no idea how you get to that. It just does not compute. Now, he was slightly messing with my head, I think, because when we sat down and asked about the resurrection, he doesn't believe what I believe, but it wasn't quite as stark as what he said initially. But he believes all kinds of things that I don't believe. And yet, when you talk to him about, or talk to him about what he did on a Sunday morning and how some people got healed when he laid hands on them, I'm like, that just, how does that work? I have no idea. Answers on a postcard, please. What messes with my head more than anything else is that people who are different, God seems to use. That if I was God, I would go, no. and it messes with my head. But what I've discovered is that parts of the church that I had dismissed in my fear and judgment are incredible human beings doing amazing things in the name of Jesus. And there is a richness of theological wrestling and mission and curiosity out there that is so much bigger than I had ever imagined it to be. And if I can engage with them with curiosity rather than judgment and closed-mindedness, I am so much richer for it. So curious. And the third thing, and this leads us to where we're going just at the end of this service this morning, is I think it, this passage says, make every effort to keep the unity of the spirit. Keep Jesus center. When Jesus is the center, when we gather around him, when I see the spirit of God in brothers and sisters from different traditions and different practices with different beliefs and things that actually I don't necessarily agree with, when I see the spirit of God in them, when I see Jesus in them, we are one regardless of all the differences. So over the last few years, we've been using the creed, and for many of us, the creed is not part of our tradition. The reason we're using the creed is because these are the things that we gather around. I believe in God the Father. I believe in Jesus. I believe in the Holy Spirit. They're things that Christians affirm in slightly different ways all around the world, in all kinds of different traditions, all throughout the ages. We've gathered around these kind of creedal statements because we see Jesus in people who are different to us. Everything else is up for grabs. I'm more convinced about the creeds than I've ever been. I'm less certain about anything else. And so we gather 
around Jesus and the Spirit of God in other people and hold all other things with a good dose of humility and curiosity in the other, together in difference. Our third oxymoron. Shall we pray and then move into bread and wine? The open mic and my meanderings mean that we're just running a few minutes late. But Father, thank you so much for your spirit that is at work here, even in the midst of the differences that we have, different people, different beliefs, different thoughts, different worldviews, different ages, different ethnicity, genders, and yet you call us to be one. Help us, oh God, by your spirit, to love and let that love cover over a multitude of differences and sins that we would be known for our love for one another. Amen. Roy and Louise are just going to lead us in the creed and bread and wine and the band.